All right, good morning. Good morning, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, please sign into the attendance. Uh, you have to sign in when you get here. Um, I forgot the name cards. If you don't have a name card, just see me after class, I'll give you one. I think most of you should have one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just come to my office after class in 623 and I'll, I'll get you a name card, okay? If you don't have a name card, just come to my office after, so I'll give you one. Uh, questions, your hand was up and I, I do look like waved you off. No, it doesn't. Well, you should answer the question. Well, I mean to myself. Uh, well you're, you're present, but you should answer the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the attendance is separate from the quiz. The quizzes are not graded, but you should do them because they're for your own benefit. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. Let's start with the question today. Okay. Open iClick or Cloud. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, resume. Oh, here we go. They ch I'm sorry, they changed the way this thing works, and it's a little bit weird. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here's your, here's your question for today. Which enumerated power or powers in Article 1, Section 8, did Chief Justice Marshall rely on McCulloch v. Maryland to uphold the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States? A, the Commerce Clause, B, the Taxing Power, C, the Necessary and Proper Clause, D, all of the above. About 30 seconds to think about it. A few seconds. All right. Uh, where did I leave off last time? Who was last? Okay, Colby, you're last. So is that Leslie or Jason? Who's next? Okay, you always point to the next guy, right? All right, Jason. No, no, you're up. <laughs> Jason, what do you think the answer is here? All right, you say C. Why do you say C? Then why isn't it D all the above? If you're saying that the necessary and proper clause is a means of executing the taxing power, then why is not the answer D? Deanna, what do you think? So you don't you think the answer is not D? Yeah, I think it's C also. Okay. Let one more. Vanessa, what do you think? Um, I also think C. Okay. Can the necessary and proper clause, Vanessa, stand by itself as an independent grant of power? Yes. It just has to link up one of the two. Okay. Okay, let's see what we got. Let's see our results. Oh, very good. That's the right answer. C. C is correct. And this is a question that I think a lot of uh, law students might get tripped up on. You didn't, which I'm actually uh, relieved to see. And let me explain why the answer is C. The necessary and proper clause is an independent grant of power, right? It links back, I'll use your nests where I like that word, it links back to something else. So, you know, you need a bank as a means to regulate commerce. You need a bank to collect taxes, right? You need that linkage. But the necessary and proper clause is not dependent upon the commerce clause. 
indeed it goes beyond the Commerce Clause, right? You can regulate stuff under the Necessary and Proper Clause that you could not regulate under the Commerce Clause by itself. It goes beyond it. Um, here's the riddle, my friends. Whenever you have any sort of, uh, whenever, whenever you have any sort of um, question on enumerated powers, and I ask you, you know, what provision of the Constitution gives Congress the power to do X, right? Whatever it happens to be, you always have to think about the necessary and proper clause. It's always lurking in the background. Right? It's always sort of just floating around in the background. Now, what makes this topic a little bit more complicated is that the Supreme Court will not always mention the Necessary and Proper Clause. You are going to have some cases based on enumerated powers where the court only talks about the Commerce Clause, for example. Right? They only mention Commerce Clause. But you need to know, because you're smart law students, that the Necessary and Proper Clause is sort of working in the background. Um, indeed, a lot of law professors don't fully understand this thing. Oh, commerce clause, commerce clause, commerce. It's actually necessary and proper clause. Okay? All right, so is that uh, uh, Caitlin? Mm -hmm. So, Caitlin, let's just review a little bit from last class. So, last class we had a case called Gibbons versus Ogden, right? Remember what that case was about? That was the Kentucky boat. Yeah, very good, very good. Just, just, just generally, what are the facts in that case? Very good. So who was trying to regulate the boats initially? Do you remember? The the state. Exactly right. So New York tried to grant a monopoly on boats going from New York to New Jersey. Very good. Thank you. Um, and the court held, no, no, no. The states cannot regulate boats moving from state to state because that's interstate commerce. Right? The definition of commerce in Gibbons v. Ogden hasn't changed much in 200 years. It's basically the same thing. Commerce refers to intercourse, stuff moving between states. Okay. The readings for today, when we do DeWitt and EC Knight and those cases, those cases are not about shipping stuff between states. Those cases are about things happening locally within a state. When you have activity that's local, you're not only looking at the Commerce Clause. You always have to look at the Necessary and Proper Clause. So in any one of these cases, always think Necessary and Proper. Everyone with me? Our first case today, Prig versus Pennsylvania, is a um, important decision about the Necessary and Proper Clause, but not in the way you think about it. Right, Prig isn't about regulating the sale of oil or the manufacture of sugar, right, or child labor. Prig is about something very, very different. And it's about one of those issues that um, marred our uh, original Constitution in a way that uh, to this day we're still kind of living with. And that was the fugitive slave clause. Right? Let's start with, uh, is that Katie? Yes. All right. So we have here Article 4 of the Constitution. Right? Katie, Article 4 has this provision. And I'll just read it. It says, no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered upon claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. It, I agree, it's not an easy thing to read, right? It's, it's sort of complicated, these clauses don't line up. So let's just walk through one step at a time. What is this text actually saying, Katie? What, what's, what's going on here? Okay, all right, I, th I think that's a good, it's a good start, right? So first off, we see this phrase, no person held to service or labor. The framers 
refused to use the word slavery. That was a very deliberate move. They were, depending who you ask and how you read it, but my general read is they were embarrassed. They didn't, they didn't want to put the word slavery into the Constitution because they knew it was an immoral thing. They recognized at least that much. And again, this is a, dis a matter of dispute, but that's more my opinion of how I read the history, but I think there are people who disagree with me on that one very vigorously, in fact. But they didn't use the word slavery. That much we call agree on. So if a person is a slave in one state, let's just say Maryland, to make it easier, right? And they're a slave under the laws of the state of Maryland. And that person escapes. Now, um, is that uh, a Jamie? Now, what does it mean for a person to escape? That actually makes a, uh, that plays an important role in the next case we have to read. What does it mean to escape? Does that mean with or without permission? Well, she was given permission. Oh. Who gets to decide if the person's escaping or leaving with permission? The owner. Does the Constitution say who resolves that question? Yeah. So in any sort of legal dispute, there are often questions of proof, right? I say. I'm leaving with permission. He says, you're leaving without permission, right? Who gets to make that decision? And the Constitution, I think, is silent on that question. It doesn't, doesn't say one way or the other. And now you're starting to see how the Pennsylvania law started to come into fruition, right? The Pennsylvania law established a judicial proceeding to decide whether, in fact, this person was a runaway or, in fact, with a consent to leave. But the Constitution's silent on that. I don't, I don't think it gives an answer. I think uh, I did this one already, right? Did I do this yeah. row? OK, so Ben, I think you're next. OK, so now it says, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor. And this is not. So it's basically saying, he shall not be discharged from service or labor because of a law in the state. What's that saying? Was that, that, that it's, again, it's framed in like the positive, it's actually the negative, because it begins with no. So doesn't it mean if a slave runs away from a state and goes into another state which outlaws slavery, yes. that won't make him a free man? Okay, very good. What this is saying is that, and I'll just use Maryland and Pennsylvania to keep it easy, right? A person escapes from Maryland to Pennsylvania no matter what Pennsylvania does, they cannot enact a law that discharges a person, emancipates, right? Just use the word, word right? They can't enact a law that emancipates the person, right? So Pennsylvania cannot enact a law that emancipates runaway slaves. That much we can say for sure, right? Uh, Nick, what would happen if Pennsylvania enacted such a law that emancipates the runaway slaves. What, what, what would happen to that law? What, what, would, we, what, would, what would happen? It would be, I guess, directly competing with the laws of another state, of the southern state. Not of the southern state. Of if, the Constitution? If, and what happens when a law conflicts with the Constitution? The Constitution reigns supreme. Because of what provision? Supremacy clause. Bingo. Because of the supremacy clause, right? The Constitution is supreme law of the land. If any state law discharged as emancipated a slave, it would be inconsistent with the Constitution. Is everyone with me? OK, everyone with me? OK, last part. But shall be delivered as, but the person shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Dylan, what, what does that last provision actually say? Like, what's going on there in that last clause? Well, it says, on claim of the party. What does that mean, claim of the party? Claim of the party. How, what, what, just, in, in, you know, you're, you're a first-year law student, whatever, second-year law student. Claim of the party. What does that just suggest in your mind? How, where do you make such a claim? Generally, if you, want, if, you, if you have a legal issue and you have a claim, where would you go to make that claim? Court. Court? I think it goes to a court, right? Everyone agree with me? And does it say which court, state court, federal court? No, it doesn't. So it kind of leaves open. So 
at a minimum, I mean, one way this could work is the uh, slave owner would go to a court and say, hey, that person's a runaway. He escaped. And at that point, the state courts would then be obligated to say, OK, indeed, he's a runaway. And then Dylan just finished up. Who does the delivering? Right? Who actually delivers it? Isn't it the state that the state yeah. The state of Pennsylvania would have to use their own individuals to facilitate the transfer. All right, everyone generally see how this operates. It, it, the Constitution doesn't spell out with, with specificity how this operates, but it generally involves the interaction between a slave owner in Maryland and the state government in Pennsylvania. And the state government in Pennsylvania would have to take certain steps to return the person. Everyone with me? OK. Um, Mitchell, does this provision say anything about Congress? Does, does the federal government have any role whatsoever in, in this text? Apart from, in my eyes, like apart from stating the supremacy clause, I don't Well, that's even the Constitution. Congress doesn't need to do anything. This is, this is Constitution, Supreme Law. There's no, there's no need to have. So, Mitchell, I think you're right. This says nothing about Congress, right? Why then did Congress enact the Fugitive Slave Act? Again, distinguish, please don't make this up in, mess this up in your notes. This is a Fugitive Slave Clause, right? The Fugitive Slave Clause in Article 4. That's different from the Fugitive Slave Act, which Congress enacted in the 1790s. In fact, I'm embarrassed. Randy and I had a typo in the book, which we, fi we fixed at a fairly late juncture, but we confused it to. I was very mad at myself, because I always correct my students on this one, but it's, it's easy to make the mistake. So Mitchell, why then did Congress enact the Fugitive Slave Act? What was the, what was the thinking there? Oh, that's very good. That's very good. Just give me one more thing. What exactly did the Future Slave Act do? That I should have probably started there. Um, Force states to return slaves. Okay. Slaves that once were slaves. Okay. The Future Slave Act um, tried to provide some rules through through which this provision should be. Um, implemented. And I'll summarize it. It made it very easy, right? It made it very easy for, I'll, u I don't, I'll use the word slave catcher, there's no other word. Did anyone see the movie? It was a 12 Years a Slave. Powerful movie. Uh, but that movie describes this sort of dynamic. Um, very often, the slave were not actually catching runaway slaves, they were just kidnapping people to sell them down south. Um, they, they would say, ah, this is so-and-so from so-and-so plantation, ran away. Uh, was there any proof of this? No. Was there any sort of um, you know, evidence? Not really. Uh, was there any sort of um, uh, court process to determine, was this in fact John Smith, right? Was this in fact the person they claim it is? No. OK. So under the federal law, once a person basically makes a sort of claim, there was virtually zero process, um, zero procedures to verify if the claim was accurate. OK? So the federal law made it basically saying, OK, you make this claim, you get the person, right? Um, now, you can imagine a lot of the northern states, which were abolitionists as they, 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 they post slavery, uh, were very much concerned about the Fugitive Slave Act, right? They recognize that their own people, who may be citizens in their state, maybe they were voting, right? They might have been property holders, right? Free blacks. They were getting seized up and sold downriver, to use the phrase, right? So they enacted what were called personal liberty laws. Personal liberty laws. Um, Amy, walk me through. What is the Pennsylvania personal liberty law, please?
OK, so how would one get one of these certificates of removal? You have to go to a judge, I'm sure, but like, what do you have to actually do? Well, in this case, right, we'll get to the facts in a minute, but in this case, was the certificate of removal actually issued from, for Ms. Morgan? No. Okay. Why do you think the judge denied a certificate for Morgan? Just, just. Because she was not an escapee. Yeah. She was not a runaway. Okay. The important aspect of the personal liberty law was that the judge could determine independently whether, in fact, the claim was valid, right? There will be a hearing, there might be a trial, to determine, is this actually a valid claim of runaway? If it's not a runaway claim, then they won't issue the certificate. And if they don't issue the certificate, then, pr then the slave catcher cannot uh, remove the slave from the, uh, or remove, the, remove Morgan, in this case, from the jurisdiction, right? What do we call it when you take a person against their will? It's called kidnapping, right? In other words, if in Pennsylvania, if you fail to get the certificate and you still move the person, you are a kidnapper, which is a state crime. And that's how this case began. All right, so Kyle, you want to give me the facts, please, in, in, in Prig? OK. Um, and then what, what again, what we, I said a minute ago, but the of, yeah. yeah. W what did Prig do that was illegal? Without getting, without getting the court's permission. Very good. Very good. And again, the reason why the certificate was denied was according to our best evidence, she was, she was freed, right? She was allowed to leave voluntarily, right? The widow apparently didn't agree with that. But that wasn't her call. OK. So Prig is arrested. He's charged with kidnapping in violation of the liberty law. He's convicted, right? Braden, what is Prig's defense? Right? What, what's his argument on appeal? Um, his argument basically is that the Fugitive Slave Act of like 1793 trumps the personal liberty laws of Pennsylvania. Very good. What case does this remind you of? We only had like four or five cases so far, but this reminds you of a case, I think. Yeah, what case does this remind you of? I don't know. I, I think uh, the uh, mind is the Odin one. Ogden, yeah. Ogden. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, in that case, New York created this monopoly, and Gibbons came along and said, no, 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 it's preempted by federal law. Uh, a, a second answer might be McCulloch, right? Maryland had this tax on the bank, and the court said, no, 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 the tax is not valid because the federal law is supreme. If you notice, all these cases share a common thread. In each case, there's a state law, and then there's a federal law that, 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 that trumps over it. Right? That's how these cases arose. Like, it's not like today where you go to court and say, oh, I'm, I'm challenging this law as unconstitutional. Rather, the state tried to enforce their law, and as a defense, the defendant raised the federal supremacy clause as his defense. Everyone with me, have I understand? OK. So therefore, this case had to determine whether, in fact, the Pennsylvania liberty law was constitutional. And to determine if the Pennsylvania law is constitutional, we have to decide, is the federal Fugitive Slave Act valid? If the Slave Act is valid, then the state law to the contrary is void by virtue of the supremacy clause. Okay, so this case, again, turned on whether the Fugitive Slave Act was valid. Okay, come with me. Now, most law students have heard the Dred Scott case, right? This was a case that effectively said uh, people of African descent could never be citizens, no matter what, right? This is a case that, you know, is viewed universally as wrong, as immoral, use whatever word you want to use. And most people know the name um, Roger Tawney, Chief Justice Tawney, who wrote the Dred Scott decision. In fact, 
uh, not even a year ago in Maryland, his home state, they took down a statue of him because he's considered such a, such a, such a polarizing figure. Okay, that's Dred Scott, 1857. How many have ever heard of Prig before this class? No one. Oh, maybe a couple people. How many have ever heard of Joseph Story before this class? Let me tell you something. Prig was far worse for the cause of emancipation than was Dred Scott. Right? Dred Scott was decided only a couple years before the Civil War. At this point, things were already going downhill. It was, <laughs> it was bad, right? But Prig was a decision that lasted for decades and allowed basically the perpetuation of slavery in the Union in ways that Dred Scott could not have, right? Um, if Prig had gone the other way, slavery would have collapsed probably much sooner than it did. Because the fugitive slave trade, that is the transatlantic trade, was abolished, the kidnapping aspect became a very important element of preserving slavery. Uh, this decision had a much greater impact on our nation than Dred Scott did. Most people just don't know the decision. Um, in fact, Chief Justice Ch Tawney joined the majority. He didn't even write the majority opinion. Most people forget about that. So this was a very significant case. Get with me. Okay. Um, uh, I pause to note, and Randy makes a big deal about this because he likes Chief Justice Chase, uh, but Salmon Chase was an abolitionist lawyer. Uh, his nickname was the Chief Justice of Runaway Slaves. That was his uh, nickname. I'm sorry, uh, the Attorney General of Runaway Slaves. I messed it up. The, the Attorney General of Runaway Slaves. And he was a lawyer in Cincinnati. And he actually argued uh, in court before Prigg that the Fugitive Slave Act was unconstitutional. Okay? And his argument was based on the structure of the Constitution. Uh, what do I mean by this, by structure? Um, we look at Article I of the Constitution. And Article I lists all the powers of Congress. They can regulate commerce, they can establish postal roads, they can collect taxes, taxes et cetera. Okay? All their powers are listed in Article I, Section 8. Then we have Article IV. Right? Chase looks at Article IV. And Article IV is missing a very important word. The word it's missing is power. Right? In Article I, Congress has the power to do this, have the power to do that. But look at Article IV, Section 2. It doesn't describe any powers for Congress. It doesn't even mention congressional power. Uh, so Chase argued in his, in his attorney capacity that Article IV doesn't give Congress a power. Right? And because Congress doesn't have a power in Article IV, they can't enact the Future Slave Act. All right. Now, uh, is that Kimberly? Yeah. Now, Kimberly, I, t I say this at the beginning of class, but in any enumerated powers case, what must we always consider sort of lurking in the background? The necessary and proper clause. Bingo. The necessary and proper clause. Can we just look at Article 4? Is that enough, Kimberly? No. Okay. So in this case, what provision of the Constitution gives the federal government the power to enact the Fugitive Slave Act. What does Justice Story rely on? Um, he relied on the necessary and proper clause and the Fugitive Okay, very good. You need both of them. It's not, it's not like combined. It's, it's necessary and proper clause is the basis, right, which links back. Um, Chief Justice, I'm sorry, not Chief Justice. Justice Joseph Story uh, bases his decision in large part on the necessary and proper clause. Okay? Uh, Fosa, what case does Story rely on? We've only had a couple of cases so far. But what's like the major case that Story relies on with respect to the necessary and proper clause? I'm sorry? No, that's not, that hasn't been decided yet. What case does Story rely on? He doesn't mention it. But what case is he relying on? 
Oh, um, that's an impossible cause. That has to be um, Andrew McCulloch. McCulloch, Maryland. McCulloch, Maryland. Yeah, who's Andrew? That's a good one. I, uh, no, no, you're right. No, no, what's his name? Was it William? I think it was William McCulloch. But yeah, you're right. McCulloch, right? Thank you. And actually, I think I did you guys last time, didn't I? Well, I have to look. I don't know. Okay, well, I, that's fair. Well, you get, you get a, <laughs> you did, you did good anyway. Okay. Uh, I, I try, I try, I, did, I try to remember not to call people twice, but if I do, just, just tell me. Um, McCulloch, right? McCulloch was a Nestor and Proper Clause case by the bank. And Chief Justice Marshall basically said, right, if it's legitimate to have a bank, then the courts aren't going to scrutinize the means Congress chooses, right? Uh, if it's a convenient, if it's an appropriate way of achieving Congress's powers, then they can do it, okay? Marshall writes, I'm going to read you this quote. He says, the end being required, it has been deemed a just and necessary implication that the means to accomplish it are given also. Or in other words, that the power flows as a necessary means to accomplish the ends. All right, let me unpack that for you. Uh, you've all heard the expression, do the ends justify the means? You know that sort of expression, right? Uh, in other words, is it really worth it to do all this stuff to get to our goal? Um, con law, constitutional law, often discusses the means and the ends, right? The means and the ends. Um, what, were, what are the means? That's what you're doing, right? In this case, the means is a future slave act. Right? Congress enacted this federal law. What are the ends? Uh huh. Justice Story explains that the ends are uh, the need to preserve relations between the states and ensure that one state cannot emancipate, cannot free any runaway slaves. So the question is this Is there a reasonable fit? In other words, is the Fugitive Slave Act a reasonable way of preserving slavery in the United States? Well, if that's the question, yeah, it works quite, it works quite well. That's the, end of the, that's the end of the case. It's a story. So long as there's a reasonable relationship between what Congress is doing and what they're trying to achieve, the law is valid. The courts will not closely scrutinize how Congress exercises its power. Again, there might be other ways of achieving this goal, but the court is not going to dictate to Congress how they should do their job. So long as Congress is doing a reasonable job, and I use, that phrase, I use the phrase reasonable loosely because it doesn't really mean anything, what's a reasonable person, I don't know, right? But so long as Congress acts in some sort of reasonable fashion, the courts will not second guess them. Everyone understand what I'm saying, right? You'll see this expression, the means and the ends, let the ends be required, right? If Congress thinks it has to do this, then we're not going to scrutinize how. And the necessary and proper clause gives Congress that flexibility to make those choices. Okay. So the holding then of Prig, right, is that the necessary and proper clause gives Congress the authority to enact the Future Slave Act. That it's a necessary, that is a appropriate means of ensuring that northern states don't interfere with slavery. And that's a holding of Prigg. Um, Chief Justice Chase argued viciously to the contrary. And he argued that this law was not valid, that Congress did not have the power to engage in this sort of law. Everyone with me? Um, generally, we think of uh, the cause of states' rights as something favoring slavery, right? That the slave states wanted to have 
you know, strong states' rights, state power. Uh, this case teaches the exact opposite. Um, in this case, it was the northern states, the abolitionist states, that favored the states' rights approach, that favored limited federal power. And it was the southern states, Maryland, the slave state, that wanted this overarching federal government to control. Um, so this case, you know, sort of challenges what people often think about um, the relationship between the states and the federal government before the Civil War. It's sort of the opposite of what you might think. Here, the southern states were all too happy to rely on the strong federal government, and Pennsylvania was trying to have a narrow conception of, of uh, enumerated powers. Okay. Questions on Prig? Yes, sir. Say the last part of your question. I think I lost you in the last sentence. Just one more time, please. Um, if you find any article in the, in the Constitution that doesn't expressly details the enforcement and redress of Congress, it's unconstitutional? Well, Prick says the opposite, doesn't it? Right? What you're arguing is Justice Chase, right? Chase argued that if there's no mention of power, then Congress can't do it. In Prigg, Justice Story said, even if this provision doesn't have the word power in it, the necessary and proper clause gives Congress the power to execute that authority. So Chase said exact, I'm sorry, Justice Story said exact opposite. Does that make sense? All right, in other words, there are parts of the Constitution that don't speak of congressional power. Doesn't matter. Because the necessary and proper clause links back and gives Congress the requisite authority. Make sense? All right, any, any other questions on Prig? All right, we will return to the topic of slavery when we do uh, Dred Scott in mm. about five or six weeks or so. Um, but the Fugitive Slave Clause decision, Dred uh, Prig, uh, in, a, a, a empowered Congress, and they enacted an even stricter version of the law. And many people in the United States feared that the Supreme Court would actually hold uh, that slavery would exist in all states, right? right? What if a person brought his slave from Maryland to Pennsylvania, would that person be free while he's in Pennsylvania? Uh, Dred Scott would hold that the answer is no, that even a, 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 a slave who's transported to a free state remains a slave. So Prigg started in motion the idea that slavery would exist beyond the boundaries of the slave states and it would go into the free states. And that was one of the last straws uh, before the Civil War began. Uh, Abraham Lincoln famously said, a house divided against itself cannot stand, cannot be half slave or half free, one or the other. Um, and indeed, Lincoln was right. You could not have this sort of uh, a divided house. It just It could not stand together. Uh, yes, Vanessa. Oh, did I screw it up? I might have said the wrong I thing. I don't know. Um, so the necessary and proper clause gives Congress the power to enact the Fugitive Slave Act. Act. Yes. I think I said that. If I didn't, I apologize. I, uh, again, uh, Randy and I, had, I, it was my mistake, but I made this mistake in one of our drafts, and I was so mad at myself. I always yell at students, make sure you get it right, and even I'm, I, we're, all, we're all human. So you do the best you can. Yeah, we had, in, in the video, I hope you're all watching the videos for this, but in the video we actually had to re-record one of the lines because I said Fugitive Slave Clause when I meant to act with to re-record the audio. Okay. By the way, are you guys watching the videos? I, I would encourage you to. It's not required, but they're, they're very good. Um, and the bookstore will have it in stock in about two weeks, so you can go buy a copy of the book when it comes out. But for now, the things, the PDFs online will help you. Okie doke. Any questions so far on Prig? Yes, sir. Uh, Nolan. So was it actually the Fugitive Slave Clause that gave him the power, but the Necessary Proper Clause? I, if you were to ask me, I think the answer is a Necessary Proper Clause. Um, he says, uh, that quote, the end being required, the power flows as a necessary means to accomplish the end. And that's a Necessary Proper Clause argument. It links, no question, to the Slave Clause. But Story doesn't actually argue that the Slave Clause by itself gives enough power. You need the necessary and proper clause. Yeah. This clause isn't a part of the congressional section. Of it's not. It's part of. Is this a power? 
power that the federal government has in general, so the Supreme Court can do it, the executive branch can do it, Congress can do it. Are you saying the Nesting Proper Clause, you're asking? No, I'm saying the ability to en enforce this clause. Right. Well, you need to go back to Article 1, Section 8, which is the Nesting Proper Clause. Uh, so it says Congress has the law. I'm sorry, Congress has the power to make laws, right? It's so only Congress can make laws. Um, uh, yeah, yes. Right, so it says the foregoing powers and all their powers. So the all their powers story says links to this fugitive slave clause. But is it actually a power? Chase says no. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, name tag later. Matt, oh, Matt thank you. Okay. Yeah. Clause. I can't remember the name. Commandeering. Commandeering. Okay, let, let me let me mention. I wasn't going to mention it, but, but I'll be happy to bring it up. Um, uh, Matt, I was ask you this question because you you pose it. Matt, could could Congress just pass a law that mandates the governor to trans transport any runaway slaves? Could Congress do that? Uh, no. Why not? All right. Well, <laughs> fine. Let me, let me walk through this, right? So let's talk about the cons let's, look, let's talk about the, uh, the the supremacy clause in it, right? Okay. Um, actually, one second. Let me get another. Uh, oh, I do want to answer your question. Okay. So Article Six, right? Clause two. And now we, I'll add it. I didn't think to add it, but I'll add it for, for you. OK. OK. All right, so Matt, let's walk through this, right? Okay. Article 6 of the Constitution has what's called the Supremacy Clause, right? It says the Constitution and the laws of the United States are the supreme law of the land. So far, so good. And the next clause, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. That is bound by the supreme law. And what is the supreme law? The Constitution laws of the United States. Um, the Constitution only mentions state judges here. And I think that's quite deliberate. Uh, state judges are often responsible for applying laws of different governments. Think of diversity jurisdiction, for example. OK. Under the Future Slave Act, state judges are responsible for processing the claims, right? Could Congress bind the state judges by the Future Slave Act? Story says yes, right? Story says that the state judges are bound by this federal law. But what about state executive branch officials, right? What about state executive branch officials? Think of like the police department, right? It wasn't really a police department, but the equivalent. Is a executive branch official bound by federal law? Some of it, not all of it, right? Executive branch officials have to support the Constitution, right? The actual Constitution itself. It doesn't mention anything about supporting federal law. Right? It, it just says that they're bound to support the Constitution, whereas judges are bound by laws of the United States. Um, story draws a distinction between the state judges who are bound by federal law and the state executive branch officials who are only bound by the Constitution. Today, we call this concept the anti-commandeering principle. Right? Let, me, let me just I'll write it. Okay. The anti-commandeering principle. Uh, that phrase is not used by story, but that's what the phrase is called today. And the anti-commandeering principle generally holds that Congress cannot require state officials, state executive officials, to implement federal law. Right? They can require state judges to do stuff, 
but they cannot require state executive branch officials. Why not? The answer turns the necessary and proper clause. Okay? That is, it's not a necessary and proper power to require state officials to implement federal law. We will do this, I think, in about a week or two. We'll get back to this. But Prig is an early decision where the court recognizes that Congress doesn't have the power to conscript to force state officials to take actions. Yes, sir. Oh, is that a, re as, as, as a stretch? Okay. Okay, does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Yeah. For the judges, right. but not for the state officials, right? In other words, the, the Congress can't force the Pennsylvania executive branch to return away slaves, but they can conscript the judges to implement this, right? Because if you think about it, originally there were not federal courts. Federal courts were only added at some point later. Under the original design, state judges would have to actually implement federal law, which is why the which is why that's phrased the way it is. State judges have a higher burden. Justice Scalia would develop this in the 1990s, almost 200 years later. So it, it didn't, story, story did a good job, but here's a problem, right? People don't like setting pre because it's like pro-slavery. So they think, oh, Scalia made it up. It's actually, it, it comes earlier. It comes from story in large part. You know, people don't like talking about pre, but it was an important decision for enumerated powers. Yeah, good question. All right, let's, let's move on. Um, the next case is a lot more boring, uh, which is something because boring is a good thing, right? First case is like, oh my God, slavery, this is awful. The next case, oh, who cares about oil, right? You know, who the hell cares about selling lamps? Um, uh, Michael, you want to give me the facts, please, in the United States versus do it? I guess uh, Congress enacted a law prohibiting the sale of um, oil. Yeah, very good. Okay, very good. So, Michael, let me ask you a more follow-up question. Did did Mr. DeWitt ship his oil across state lines anywhere? No, it was uh, local. Yeah, in Detroit. Okay, very good. Oh, and what's your name? Mm -hmm. Angela. Okay, Angela. Um, what gives Congress the power to prohibit the local sale of oil, for example? Which, which? Which clause of the Constitution gives Congress the power to prohibit local oil sales? Uh, a little bit louder, I can't hear you. I'm saying, is it the necessary and proper clause? Okay, so walk me through that. Why, why does the necessary and proper clause give Congress that power? Okay, Zinnia? I'm sorry? I, oh, I'm sorry, Des Desiné. Desiné. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, doesn't. Why not? Because uh, the sale of oil within the state is local. Oh, so the necessary and proper clause doesn't get you there. Okay, so here we have a case, right, where the court looks at the Constitution and they say, is this commerce among the several states? The answer is no. That's an easy one, right? There's no actual shipment of goods across state lines. So then you have to look to the necessary and proper clause. You always do. And Chief Justice Chase wrote this opinion. And he rejects the necessary and proper clause argument. Why? Because this local transaction is too remote, too distant for interstate commerce. Right? It's too remote from interstate commerce. Okay? Now, Caroline, what's the other argument the government raises? They don't just argue about the Commerce Clause, they argue about another provision that, that, that's a little bit relevant here. Okay, very good. So, what's the taxing power argument? Could, could Congress have taxed local oil? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is an important point. We'll get back to this with the Obamacare case in about a week. 
Congress's taxing powers are very broad, and Congress could tax the sale of oil. Remember that line in the song, they tax our whiskey, we get frisky, right? Remember that one? From Hamilton, right? Congress can tax local stuff. They can tax local, they can put duties in local stuff, right? They didn't tax it here, though. Instead, they tried to criminalize it. Okay, now, Brandon, let me ask you a question. This one's a little tricky. Congress, let's say that Congress puts a tax on oil number one, right? Just oil number one. And people say, oh man, I don't want to pay the tax on oil number one. I'm going to use oil number two. Can Congress ban oil number two no. to, to try and encourage people to pay the tax on oil number one? OK, tell me why not. What does Chase say about this one? Good, very good. Why? Bingo. There's that phrase, the ends justify the means. I mentioned that about 20 minutes ago, right? He says this analogy fails. Congress can't criminalize the sale of oil number two to encourage people to pay the tax on oil number one. Right? This consequence is too remote and too uncertain. In other words, it's not necessary. It's not appropriate. Sergio, is this opinion consistent with Chief Justice Marshall's decision in McCulloch? In other words, does Story, I'm sorry, does Chase read necessary the same way that Marshall did? No. You say no, okay. By the way, Randy and I disagree on this one. I think that, I think that Chase is basically ignoring Marshall. Randy thinks he's not, but I, I'll, I'll see it to my, my senior author. But you tell me why I think the answer is no, Sergio. I think you're right, by the way. <laughs> Whatever it's worth. We, Randy and I agree on like 95%. There's one thing we don't agree on, but it's close, you know, tri trivial stuff. Is it because Chase said that we don't need to, I guess, broaden the federal power? Yeah. Well, how did Marshall read necessary in McCulloch? Do you recall? Um, what were some of the words he used in McCulloch? Yeah. Oh. Well, you're right, but just let him talk. Yeah. I don't think he heard you. <laughs> useful? Useful, good. Um, Sergio, let me ask you, is having a tax on oil B a useful way of collecting tax? I'm sorry, is banning oil B a useful way of raising revenue for oil A? Yes. I think so, right? Sergio, do you think um, Chase's decision is consistent with, with uh, a story in Prig about the necessary and proper clause? Uh, no, and he basically ignored Prig. Yeah. So Randy and I Randy and I agree this much. Chase basically ignored Prig. Right? Chase just he didn't agree with Prig. We know he thought it was wrong. He ignored it. And at a minimum, he he didn't go beyond what Marshall said. That's much as clear. I think he ignored Marshall also. But DeWitt had a very um, narrow Right? DeWitt had a very narrow construction of federal power. Right? Federal implied powers. Um, I encourage you all to take a look at, uh, where is it? The video, uh, I'll put a screw. Where is it? OK. Uh, give me three more seconds. OK. <coughs> So if you look at this, um, it's, this is in the video for Lopez. You haven't gotten there yet. But this video, we try to um, graphically represent implied powers. I know it's hard to see. Um, uh, it'll look better on your, on your phone. Um, but we have over here, here McCulloch, right, and John Marshall. And let's say McCulloch is this high, right? It read implied power as a little bit big, right? But then Prig read implied powers in a very large way. And then in DeWitt, it sort of shrank it back and brought it back to normal. Let me show you a, a scene where it zooms in. OK, that's a little bit easier to read, right? So you start off here with McCulloch, right? McCulloch read the Nestor and Proper Clause saying what's useful, what's convenient. But Prig basically went even beyond that. Prig said that basically anything that's 
within Congress's discretion is valid. Prig is one of the most broad rings and implied powers you're ever going to get. But then we get to the next case, which is DeWitt. And DeWitt drops it back down, right? DeWitt drops it back down, and I think even goes lower than Marshall. But at a minimum, DeWitt goes back to what McCulloch said, which is that you have to have some relationship that makes sense. It's not about just whatever is reasonable. It has to actually make sense. As a result, Congress did not have the power to enact this ban on the sale of oil that's local. Okay, come on with me. Now, is that Richie? Okay, or I'll, I'll give you a pass, that's fine. Uh, uh, Matt, I think you're next. Matt, what is the police power? Very good. Uh, the police power is a phrase we'll use a lot. And it refers to the power of the government to regulate the health, safety, welfare, and public morals of the people. Health, safety, welfare, and public morals. Now, Matt, one more follow-up. Which branch of government has a police power? Which, which branch of our government has a police power? The executive. Of? Of the states. Bingo. The states have this police power, right? The states can regulate the health, safety, wellness, their health, wellness, health, safety, welfare, and public morals of the people. Congress does not have a police power, right? Congress cannot enact a law uh, merely because they think it'll help people out, right? Congress can only enact a law if it falls within an enumerated power. Chase recognizes in DeWitt that the sale of oil is within the power of the state. If a state determines that some oil is dangerous or that some oil should not be on the market, the states can determine to ban it, not Congress. Now, Congress can ban shipment between states. They can do that, no question. That's, that's Gibbons, right? But Congress cannot ban the local sale of the oil in DeWitt. Okay. Questions on DeWitt? Yeah, yeah, sure. Ben. Um, wouldn't Congress be able to just tax oil? They could. Yeah, but you know what? Taxes are not popular. And there's a cause to enacting taxes, right? There were actually cases from this era where Congress put taxes on, on liquor and alcohol, right? Congress could tax things, but taxing is not popular. Look, we see this with the Obamacare case, right? Congress went out of its way to say, this is not a tax on the Affordable Care Act because it was unpopular. And the law almost was struck down on that basis. Yeah, Nick? So it might be going too far down the rabbit hole, but how is banning it somehow better than taxing it? Um, well, banning it's like, oh, he's a criminal, right? I, who cares about this criminal going to jail, right? Taxing is something that everyone would have to pay, regular merchants. So it's more public perception. Yes. The power to tax is always going to be unpopular, and Congress avoids labeling something as a tax because it's unpopular. Instead, they'll say, well, just going to ban it. All right. Now, sometimes you, know, you have tobacco tax, right? I don't even know how much a pack of cigarette costs, but you have these significant taxes that are designed to, to um, discourage people from engaging in a sin, so to speak. Uh, yeah, uh, Mitchell. Um, I'm, I missed who said who had the police powers. The states. The states have the police power, not Congress. And, and the executive branch in the states. Thank you. Everyone with me. Any other questions on DeWitt? Yeah, it, it's, it's not a very, you know, uh, uh, you know, exciting case, but I think it teaches a lesson well. Uh, by the way, this is not good law anymore. Uh, Congress bans a lot of crap that's in the states, but we'll get there. Um, the next two cases are kind of weird. Um, you have you have a uh, 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 Hepburn versus Griswold in 1870, and then you have Knox v. Lee the next year in 1871. Um, these cases are kind of strange because the Supreme Court reversed itself in the span of about a year, which um, doesn't happen very often. It, it, it's, it's, it's not very common this sort of thing happens. Um, oh, I forgot my wallet. Damn it. I, anyway, well, if you look at any piece of U.S. currency, uh, just take out your wallet and look at any dollar bill, it has the phrase uh, legal tender on it right? 
any piece of US currency as a phrase legal, you probably never noticed it. I promise you it's on every piece of US currency. Right? Uh, I'll start up front. Ruben, what does the phrase legal tender, pass around dollar bills, make sure you get them back, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't need to pass around a show and tell on that one. Uh, <laughs> Ruben, uh, what does the phrase legal tender mean? Well, not just a paper note. What does legal tender mean? Uh, it's, it's, it's a legal note that's issued by the uh, federal government. And what are people supposed to do with this, this paper? Uh, use it for commerce. And are you required to accept it? Yes. OK, that's right. The definition of legal tender is paper money that people are required to accept to satisfy debts, right? There's no doubt that Congress can print paper money, right? Of course they can, right? It's, it's, you know, they can print paper, they can print T-shirts, they can print whatever else they want, right? Uh, but the legal issue with legal tender is can the government force businesses, private parties, to accept paper money as a satisfaction of a debt, right? So Antoine, let me ask you a question, right? Let's say you and I make an agreement and I agree to pay you back in gold. Gold is a precious metal. It has an intrinsic value. You know, markets fluctuate, gold goes up and down, but gold has some value, right? Any point in human history, gold has value. Government comes along and says, no, 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 we enact this Legal Tender Act, which says that Josh pays Antoine in paper money. How do you get a react to that one, Antoine? We, we have a contract to pay a contract in gold, and you come along and I say, no, here's some, here's some paper money. I'm giving you this up instead. Yes. The paper money was worthless, right? Right. At, especially at the time of the Civil War, the paper money was not valuable. Um, it wasn't backed by anything. So, you know, what might cost one dollar today in a month now costs like two dollars, and in three months costs three dollars. Right. The the price keeps doubling. So you might have made a contract at price X, and now it's worth triple. So it's basically worthless. Um, you call this inflation if you ever took a macroeconomics class in college. During the Civil War, however, the Lincoln administration decided to enact this Legal Tender Act. And they decided that it was a necessary way to prevent uh, the collapse of the economy. The irony, of course, is who was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time? Chase, right? Chase was the Secretary of the Treasury. In fact, he put his own face on currency, right? They called it the greenback. Why is money green? It's called the greenback, right? He put his face on the currency for the, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the uh, paper note. Um, the irony, of course, is that a couple of years later, he was now the Chief Justice, and he wrote the majority opinion, which declared his own law unconstitutional. Now, did he change his mind? Did he think it was different? Eh, people can argue about this, but he came to the conclusion that this law was not valid. All right. Uh, Ethan. Walk me through Chase's analysis in the first case in Hepburn, and we'll do DeWitt in a, in a I'm sorry, uh, uh, Knox in a, in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, so from what I understood, uh, probably somewhere in the Constitution, Congress has the power to issue money. Good. But in order to make them illegal tender, Chase said that there wasn't a necessary connection between that. So the power to issue money, or the power to uh, make money illegal tender was not necessary and did not link to the power to issue money. OK, very good. All right. Um, again, there's no question that Congress could issue paper money. That's, you know, whatever. The issue is can you make people accept it to satisfy debts? So poor Miss Hepburn, right, tried to pay Mr. Griswold with paper money. <laughs> Griswold sued Hepburn in court saying this is worthless. And the court said, no, 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 you have to accept this. So the question then turned on, was this requirement valid? Here, the case turns the necessary and proper clause, right? There is no explicit provision that says Congress can issue legal tender. It, it's just there's none in the Constitution, so you need, you need implied power. In other words, there's no express power. There's no enumerated power. Therefore, you need an implied power. And what's the source of implied powers? The necessary and 
proper clause. Um, Chase looks to McCulloch v. Maryland. And he says, is this appropriate? Is this plainly adapted to legitimate ends? Right? Does the legal tender rule fit within McCulloch? Chase says no. So let's, he walks through Article 1, Section 8. For example, Congress has the power to coin money. Right? Congress can coin money. Money meant metal, right? Coins, metal. How far can you stretch this power? Does the power to coin money require a power to make paper money? Or stated differently, is it necessary to have paper money in order to have metal money? And he says no. That the power to make paper money is not incidental to the power to coin money. Right? It's not the same. Now you might say, wait a minute, Josh. Let's say you want to preserve the value of money so you print paper money also to keep the value of the coins higher. Isn't that useful, convenient? Depends how much you want to stretch, right? In other words, how deferential are we to Congress's desires? Chase is not. Again, he was the guy who backed the law in the first place, but he's saying this is not necessary. But wait a minute, Josh. What about the power to declare war, right? You're fighting a war. And if you don't have this paper money, the government might go bankrupt. Isn't it necessary to have this paper money to not lose the war? Chase says no. It's not appropriate. It adds nothing, right? And frankly, Chase says, the war eventually will end. And we cannot uphold the law based on emergency situations, these sort of exigencies. The next case turns in the exact opposite direction, we'll see. Uh, what about the power to regulate commerce and borrow money, right? Doesn't having paper money make it easier to regulate interstate commerce and borrow money? Too remote, he says, right? That the paper money is not an appropriate means of regulating interstate commerce. Therefore, the law was invalid. I want to jump back here and so you see the entire graph at once. Um, you see down here, again, Hepburn and DeWitt are over here. McCulloch is here around the same level. Um, Chase had, I think, one of the most narrow readings of necessary and proper ever. I, think, I actually think it's below McCulloch, but I'll, I'll give Randy his due. Um, but at a minimum, Hepburn and DeWitt are inconsistent with Prigg. I think everyone will agree on that much. In Prigg, they say we have to defer, we have to grant deference to the legislature. In DeWitt and Hepburn, they say, no, 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 we have to scrutinize it carefully. It's not enough to just defer. So as a result, in, in Hepburn v. Griswold, the court finds that the Legal, ten the Legal Tender Act is unconstitutional. OK, any questions on Hepburn? We'll do, we'll do Knox in a minute. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, I mean, Chase makes his point, right? Could Congress just pass a law that wipes out all debts? This effectively does that. Let's say, again, I owed Antoine $100 in gold coins, and now I have $100 in paper money that's worthless, right? He's just wiped out Antoine's debt. It's just he's nullified whatever money he was owed. Um, and I think Chase is very much upset. Uh, maybe even argue violates the due process, deprives Antoine of his property with that due process of law, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I think so, that really, because. It, even if maybe during the war you needed this, it continued after the exigency. Because right. you had the Reconstruction, there was the Depression, there was, there was uh, recessions. OK. Now, uh, is that Matt over there in the front? Yes. Matt, let me ask you a question. The court here declares that the Legal Tender Act is unconstitutional, right? Is that the end of the case? Does, does the Legal Tender Act gets just wiped out of the U.S. Code and, and thrown in the garbage? Um, 
it's not an easy question. Does the Supreme Court decision have finality to it? So if the Supreme Court decision is final, what the hell is Knox v. Lee? Wouldn't Knox just be dismissed because the court already decided the issue? If you're struggling, you're, you're thinking the right way. Yeah, Amy? I just have a question on the reading. Can you just explain the Fox? Knox. Knox. There was a little blurb that came after the case you were supposed to read. Oh, okay, yeah. I didn't know if you were supposed to read that case. I don't assign the full case because it's actually, the, the summary is better. Sergio? Um, no, it's, it's not final because people can challenge the decision. Wait a minute. How, how can you go to court and, and argue that Supreme Court decision is wrong? Well, if, if something comes up, what, what? like a case, a case needs to be presented to the Supreme Court. But doesn't, Sergio, doesn't the Supreme Court strike down laws and just, just, just you know, take a red pencil and cross it out of the U.S. code? Doesn't, is that what the court does? Does the court strike down laws? Does, don't they nullify laws or things like this? I mean, in some way, but it's still limited in scope. It's not. Tanner, you're, 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 you, see, you see him? You see him? No. Tell me why. No, they don't. Well, um, because, like, if pretty good example would be like here in Texas. Um, I know that we have a few laws that have been <coughs> ruled unconstitutional that are still in our books. Oh, we do. Yeah, we haven't taken them down. <coughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, <coughs> it's some sort of karma, I guess, for calling on you. Um, let me use a text example, right? <coughs> we had a case from Houston 15 years ago called Lawrence v. Texas. <clears throat> this case was a ban on sodomy. Okay? The Supreme Court said Texas' ban on sodomy is unconstitutional. <clears throat> if you open up the Texas Code, the statute is still there. The Supreme Court cannot take an eraser to actually erase a statute from a book. They can't do that. Thank God. They don't have that power. Um, Instead, all they can do is say, Texas, you cannot enforce the statute. Right? They can issue what's called an injunction, saying, Texas, you cannot enforce the statute. But the statute remains. And let's say in some weird circumstance, the Supreme Court reverses itself as a sodomy, we can ban it. The statute doesn't have to be reenacted. It's there. OK? Um, Natalia, in Knox versus Lee, I'm sorry, in Hepburn versus Griswold, who was the dispute between? Um, Hepburn and? and Griswold. One was Miss Hepburn was trying to use the promissory note as yeah. to pay her debts to Griswold. Okay, so who did Dred? I'm sorry, I didn't say Dred Scott. Who did Hepburn versus Griswold apply to? Who 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 is the judgment binding upon? Everybody who had promissory notes. Or Does the Supreme Court bind everyone instantly? Who is the case actually binding upon? <laughs> and? And Hepburn. Hepburn and Griswold, right? I want you to think about this thing very carefully because it's counterintuitive. The Supreme Court's decisions don't reach everyone, directly at least, right? Uh, this case resolved the dispute between Hepburn and Griswold. The dispute said that Mrs. Hepburn could pay the debt but not with paper money, that you had to pay with gold or, or metals, right? That was the outcome of the dispute. Her debt was not satisfied. Griswold could collect in, in gold. The Supreme, Court's, the Supreme Court's decisions don't affect other people. So in theory, at least, someone else comes along, in the case of Knox v. Lee, and says, aha, I don't want to use this paper money. They say, well, you're bound. They say, no, no, I'm not a stopped. Right, remember the concept of estoppel? Race judicata, it applies to the people who are involved in the litigation. 
If you are not involved in litigation, you are not stopped. You are not bound by that. There's no race judicata for you. So it's conceivable that some third party can come along and bring another challenge saying, aha, the paper money's valid. And that's how Knox v. Lee came around, right? And I'll give you a very famous example of this dynamic is Dred Scott. Dred Scott was a dispute between Dred Scott, who was a slave, and Sanford, who was the, the slave owner, right? And Justice Tawney had this long opinion, which made all these things saying, no, Dred Scott's not free, right? Long decision. The US government was not a party to Dred Scott. And Abraham Lincoln effectively said, well, the US government's not a party to Dred Scott. We're not bound by it. And he basically ignored the decision. And we'll talk about that later this semester. So this is a fairly old concept that you learn in CIFPRO that you don't think about much. But the reason why you go from Hepburn to Knox is because the decision only concerned Hepburn and Griswold, not the others. And you'll have the same dynamic in Dred Scott. All right, have one with me. Uh, so is that David? Yes. So David, walk me through the change in the composition of the court between Hepburn and Knox. It's a little confusing. That's right. And after that, uh, was it, yeah, the Judiciary Act of 1789 uh, set the number to six. Good. And then uh, that's in between Knox and Pepper. And then after that, I know Lincoln moved it up to nine. At 1.10 even. Yes. Sir. Okay. So the Constitution doesn't fix the number of justices. Statute does. We currently have nine. We've had nine for about 150 odd years. We briefly had 10. We've had as few as five, as many as six. We've had seven. We've had different numbers at different points. When Hepburn was argued in November of 1869, there were eight justices. Okay? There were eight members in the court. Okay? After the case was argued in November, they take a private vote, what's called conference. Right? The justices have a private conference, they take a vote. The vote at the conference was five to three. And Justice Greer was in the majority. Okay, five to three vote to conference. But then Greer resigns. He steps down. So when the opinions actually released in January of 1870, the vote was four to three. Um, on the Supreme Court, five votes makes a majority. Four votes is not. It's called a plurality. P-L-U-R-A-L-I-T-Y, plurality. You'll see that phrase, plurality. Right? It's not quite a majority, but it's a four-member block. Is a four-vote majority precedential? Not really. Okay. After Hepburn was decided, President Grant made two appointments to the court, Strong and Bradley. And those judges were both known to support paper money. So at this point, there was now a majority who thought the Legal Tender Act was valid. Uh, there was an internal fight about whether they would rehear the case. In other words, just re-decide Hepburn. And eventually decided, no, wait for another case. And they did. And that next case was called um, Knox v. Lee. And Knox comes out five votes the other way. Okay? And then you see how it flips, right? And in Knox v. Lee, the court reverses itself and holds that the Legal Tender Act is now valid. Now Justice Chase is in dissent. So in the span of about a year, the court totally flipped itself. Now I don't make you read Knox because it's long and kind of boring, but the upshot is it goes along with Prig. And it says if it's a you know, useful way to regulate commerce have paper money, that's enough. And Knox is probably the broadest construction of federal power um, ever. Um, go back to the timeline. Knox is up here. It's one of the broadest ones ever. It effectively says Congress can do whatever it wants so long as it has some connection to federal power. And they're not going to scrutinize it. Moreover, the court says, because we're in a, an emergency to serve this chaos caused by the Civil War, 
Congress has you know, extra leeway and discretion. As a result, the court upholds the Legal Tender Act, and it's now valid. Now Justice Chase is in dissent. Okay. Questions on Knox? Yeah, Katie? No, as long as it's consistent with uh, a, a federal power, as long as it's useful to, to execute another federal power. In other words, the courts, if, in other words, if Congress says we need to do this, that's probably good enough. Right? The courts are not going to scrutinize the means that Congress chooses to use this. And the court would then retreat in the next case, which we'll get to in a minute, which is DC Knight. Okay, questions on Knox? No? Okay, all right, we're done with the Chase Court in the 1870s. And we jump ahead to a period of time known as the Progressive Era, which there's no exact starting time, but it's generally viewed as the late 1800s, early 1900s. And people can argue about when it began and when it didn't. I don't really care. But in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we had this thing called the Progressive Era. Um, what is the Progressive Era? Uh, the book has a fairly long and somewhat tedious discussion of it. Um, what you need to know is that this was an era where people started to look towards government as a way to accomplish progress, progressive progress, right? Specifically, that they tried to use the government to improve um, living standards, uh, working conditions, uh, wages, uh, food safety. Uh, it was also concerned with, with eliminating things that were deemed immoral. Uh, alcohol prohibition was very popular in this time. Uh, they banned the lottery tickets in the, in the second case. Um, this was an era where people began to look to government to control more of what people accomplish. Um, in this first half of the class, we will only consider federal laws during the Progressive Era, right? Federal laws during the Progressive Era. In the second half of the class, we'll come back to this era. And we'll consider state laws, right? At the second half of the semester, we'll ask, do these very state laws violate the 14th Amendment, right? We'll do that later. Here we're only looking at federal laws. And the question is always the same. Does Congress have the authority to enact these federal progressive laws? And as always, our answer turns on the necessary and proper closure. I sound like a broken record, don't I? I can say the same thing over and over again for good reason. These are all cases about what are the scope of Congress's implied powers. The Commerce Clause didn't change. It's the same thing. What changes in this plot is necessary and proper clause. Everyone with me? All right, Nolan, you want to give me the facts, please, in EC Knight? Okay, so essentially the defendants were charged with violating the um, Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, which prevented um, basically Create a monopoly, as we would say, yeah. Okay. And uh, then uh, American Sugar Refinery Company um, sought to obtain these defendants so that it would essentially control the majority of sugar refineries um, and therefore control the price of the refinery, which would be a monopoly. Okay. Um, thank you. No, no, let me ask you this question, right? Did Did, did the court here consider whether Congress could ban the shipment of sugar from one state to another? Was that part of this case? Mm, no, it's about the manufacturing. Ah, okay. This case does not involve whether Congress could ban the shipment of sugar from one state to another. 
This case concerns manufacturing of sugar. In other words, had Congress came along and simply banned the shipment of sugar that was made with a monopoly, I think that probably would have been okay. But in this case, the government tried to do something different. The government tried to ban the manufacturing of sugar by these companies, or precisely to ban the acquisition, the mergers of these companies, which would make more sugar within this firm. Okay? Go with me. All right, so Nick, what did the court hold then in EC Knight? Okay, why? Why why was he, why was it appropriate to dismiss the indictment? Because manufacturing played no role in the shipment of sugar. Okay, very good. The court draws this analogy. They say that Congress can regulate interstate commerce. Everyone agrees with that. Congress can also regulate some local activity. Right? that has a direct effect on interstate commerce. You see here the courts begin to expand a little bit what Congress can do, right? The court says, look, there's some local stuff Congress can regulate, but it has to have a direct effect on interstate commerce. In this case, though, the manufacture of sugar has a secondary, or what we might call an indirect effect on interstate commerce. That the local manufacture of sugar affects interstate commerce only indirectly, or what we might call incidentally. And here the court puts forward a very uh, a famous test. The court says, commerce succeeds to manufacture and it's not part of it. Commerce succeeds to manufacture and is not part of it. What does that mean? First comes manufacturing, and second comes shipment, comes commerce. Right? That the linkage between the manufacturer and the shipment is too remote, to use Justice Chase's words. Everyone with me? Yeah. So I just want to understand the role of the Sherman Act in this particular case. Mm -hmm. So do they determine that it was unconstitutional or just wasn't applicable? D the court? Yeah. Like, how does. The court finds that in this case, the prosecution under the Sherman Act was invalid okay. because Congress didn't have the power to regulate this local transaction manufacturer. Okay. So maybe my understanding of the Sherman Act is in fully complete, but then how is that, is it in violation of the Sherman Act or not? You can't violate an unconstitutional law. So the act is unconstitutional? Not in its entirety, right? That's an important That's point. Kind of this is why I said at the outset, could Congress ban the shipment of sugar made by monopolies? Probably. Yes. But that wasn't this case. Yeah. Here they banned the actual merger Right. of the companies who want to manufacture the sugar together. This is what you might call a limiting principle, right? The court says, sure, Congress, you can go ahead and you can ban the shipment of the sugar, right? But you can't ban the manufacture. Okay, so if I understand correctly, the coming together of the cups of sugar companies were... That was, that was forming the monopoly. That, that violated the Sherman Act. But they couldn't do anything about it until it went... Yes. In other words, the Sherman Act was a very open-ended law, which said you can't have these sort of monopolies or, or, or conspiracies and things like this. What the court says is the statute as written cannot be applied to local commerce. It can only be applied to interstate commerce. Okay. Or local activity that directly affects interstate commerce. That makes sense? Kind of a weird gap there. Yeah, no, it, it's weird. Right? The court doesn't say that the Sherman Act is void in its entirety. In fact, it's still in the books today. One second, I'll get you a second, I promise. Right? But what the court says, actually it might not be in the books, I'm sorry, I think I misspoke. 
But what the court says is Congress can only regulate local activity that has a direct effect in interstate commerce. I said again, Congress can regulate local activity, local commercial activity, that has a direct effect in interstate commerce by virtue of the necessary and proper clause. But the manufacture of the, of the sugar does not have a direct effect on interstate commerce. Therefore, Congress cannot ban the manufacture. They can only ban the shipment. So your question is, what is a local activity that directly affects interstate commerce? Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's not much, yeah. which is why this test would be overruled in the 1930s. Right? I'll give you the preview. Right? The test in E.C. Knight is no longer good law. And one of the reasons why is the direct indirect line is a hard one to apply, because there's very few activities that are local that directly that directly affect interstate commerce. Uh, Mitchell, and then Ben. Well, what does affect? Oh, do you want to raise your hand? Yeah. Yeah. If it's refined in, in Houston, then it's not, you know, it's not affecting interstate commerce. Well, oh, guys, just, 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 if you want to speak, raise your hand, please. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me finish, and you can raise your hand. Yeah. The actual act of refining the oil only mm -hmm. takes place and affects the well, city of Houston. Yeah, let me, let, me, let me unpack this a bit, right? What does it mean to have a direct effect? Right? What does the word effect mean? Uh, does it mean that it might affect the price in another state? Because if you refine oil in Texas and you have a, a, a surplus of oil, that may lower the price in other states, right? But is that an effect? Or does it mean something more concrete? Right? The court doesn't really explain what direct effect means. Uh, uh, ben, I think I was up. Yeah, that was one thing I was going to ask about. They were concerned about the monopoly affecting the price of sugar, right? Because they didn't find that to be a direct effect of certain manufacturing sugar. Right, but that turns out what is effect? Does effect just mean does it affect the price? Or does it actually affect interstate commerce? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying even under the test they put forward, the monopoly would be within federal power? It seems to me like maybe that's not direct enough. But direct enough, okay. It seems to me like it is. Okay, Matt? I agree with this point, especially when you consider that, and even this, I get the sense that the judges don't really understand how the manufacture of sugar happens. I mean, there, my, my guess is that there weren't people out there refining sugar on spec, hoping that someone came along and bought it, it was they were filling orders. <coughs> and those orders could be from anywhere in the country, in, especially if you're going to control 98% of the sugar market. And so I, I don't, I, I, I feel like they use this as an excuse to, to try to limit the powers of the, of the Congress and the Sherman Antitrust Act um, without really understanding the full sort of international nationwide effect of the manufacture of sugar. Mm -hmm. like I think they just wanted to to, 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 to limit Congress's power under this Well, well let, let's, let's move into just Harlan's dissent then, right? Let's talk about Harlan's dissent. Uh, who's next? I forgot where it was. I think, uh, Nian, I think you're next? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Nian. Walk me through Justice Harlan's dissent. This is Justice John Marshall Harlan, who's actually named after John Marshall. Uh, we'll, we'll do a lot of Harlan. What, what does Harlan say? Um, he says that it's important to keep um, commerce power and state power separate um, because commerce can regulate manufacturing without um, without bringing commerce powers into it. I'm not sure I'm following. Um, Try again. What's Har how does Harlan read Congress's power to regulate local activities? He said that they can, like, they can prevent and regulate um, monopolies 
To what end? What, why does Congress have the power? What is Congress trying to accomplish by banning these monopolies? What's Congress's goal in enacting this law? What are those obstructions in this case? I think Matt and others were mentioning it a minute ago. Like effects what what is the obstruction that results from this sort of sugar monopoly? I don't think I'm sure. What happens when one company owns ninety eight percent of the market? They have a lot of power and they can misuse that by like overcharging. There. Yeah, that's it. Good. The, the dissent says that Congress has the power to protect commerce among the states from these burdens. And Harlan says that the monopoly affects directly the people of all the states. Higher prices, it's, for example. And then Congress then has the power to remedy those evils by virtue of the necessary and proper clause. In other words, if, this, if Congress has the power to ensure there's free trade among the states, then they should have also the power to eliminate the firms that create obstacles to that free trade. Harlan writes that Congress can reach whatever improperly obstructs the free course of interstate commerce with respect to buying and selling. Okay. And the necessary and proper clause gives him that authority. And here he cites McCulloch v. Maryland. He says the means and the ends are valid. He writes, the means employed are the suppression of monopoly, which restrain trade. That's what they're doing. Is it proper for Congress to eliminate these obstructions to commerce? He says yes. Therefore, Harlan says the necessary and proper clause gives Congress the authority to enact this law. <coughs> Everyone get that much so far? Uh, Leslie, let me ask you a question. Um, why do you think the majority tried to draw this direct, indirect line? What do you think they were afraid of? If, if you actually read Har if you read what Harlan's saying carefully, why do you think the court, the majority at least, tries to make this direct, indirect line? What's well, like kind of in their in their heads? Well, let me ask this question a different way. What would happen if Justice Harlan had the majority opinion? What would then be limit on federal power? Good. So what would, again, one more time, if the majority, if Harlan had the majority, what limits would exist on federal power? Very few. This is, I think, what motivates the court to adopt this direct indirect line. They are afraid. They are afraid of adopting a ruling that would open up the floodgates and let Congress do whatever it wants. If you take seriously Justice Harlan's dissent, then what are the limits, right? Anything that happens in state A might affect the prices in state B, even by a penny, right? If activity in state A affects the price in state B, then Congress can regulate it. At that point, there's no, there's no distinction between what Congress can do and what the states can do. Congress acquires the federal police power. Congress can regulate whatever they want. So the majority says, look, we have to have some line, right? We need to draw some distinction between what Congress can do and what the states can do. The states have the police power, not Congress. So the majority draws this line at direct versus indirect, which, again, no one really likes. Right? It's not easy to apply. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. But they try and draw some lines. They say, look, there's got to be something that Congress cannot do. And they draw the line at manufacturing. Congress can regulate trade, but the states regulate manufacture. Look, it's not a perfect line, but it's a line, right? This line would not hold very long. We'll see again in Champion v. Ames, it sort of gets 
ticked a little bit. But by the time you get to the 1930s, the court abolishes the rule in E.C. Knight. And when you get to the New Deal, you see it goes up and up and up and up and up, all the way up. Knight's down here, and then it keeps going. Um, we never got back to Knight. Knight was like the low point. That was, that was, that was the last hurrah, so to speak. Uh, it goes only, only up from there. <clears throat> okay, questions on E.C. Knight. By the way, Harlan was right about most things, and he would eventually be a, his position would be adopted in this one. Yeah, yeah, Ben. Well, couldn't it apply to something else? I, guess it could, it, it, I mean, in this case, it would only apply to the Sherman Act, but if you have a holding that Congress can regulate local activity that affects prices in other states, then they can dictate labor conditions, they can dictate how the sugar is manufactured, they can provide uh, uh, the wages that have to be paid, right? Once you say that Congress can regulate local activity, that's not interstate, local activity, Congress can regulate local activity, because it affects prices in other states, there's no limit. You're, you're off to the races, right? There's not much that, that can't happen at that point. Okay. Make sense? Did that go back and make a little bit, answer your question before a little bit? Yeah. One thing that made me feel better about the decision is like, did the state do anything about it? Or did they just continue? Well, to state monopoly laws are very hard to enforce because they just <coughs> move the business to another state, right? They just move it to another state. And what state wants to shut down a huge factory in their state, right? Lose jobs. Uh, so state, and Harlan gets to this, right? States are not competent to fight monopoly, right? In order to fight monopoly, you need a 50 states, well, not more 50 states, but you need a, you need a nationwide solution. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, let's do the next case. Um, uh, who am I up to? Uh, yeah. Uh, you want to give me the facts, please, Kobe, in uh, Champion versus Ames. Uh, it's also called the lottery case, because involved the lottery tickets. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, this was a law based on a progressive sense of morality that lotteries and gambling were evil, they were sins, and they were prohibited. Now, um, Kobe, you actually have stuff being shipped across state lines, right? This should be an easy case, but is a lottery ticket, is a shipment of lottery tickets commerce? Okay, why? Uh, because you can get, uh, money from it. Yeah. Uh, the court holds that the lottery ticket are subjects of traffic and are therefore subjects of commerce. And therefore, Congress can regulate the carriage of such tickets. Carriage means transportation. Right? You think about the horse and carriage, right? Carriage means transportation. So Congress regulates the transportation uh, uh, of these tickets. Okay. Uh, but the reason why. Champion Ames is an important case, is it didn't merely dictate how you ship them, it prohibited the shipment. Um, uh, Jason, does the power to regulate include the power to prohibit? What does Justice Harlan hold here in the majority? Um, yeah. Why, okay. Why does the power to prohibit include, I'm sorry, the power to regulate include the power to prohibit? Well, could the states ban the shipment of lottery tickets? No, because that's the power of Congress. No, no. Could, 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 could the state ban? Uh, yes, question differently. Could the state ban the sale of lottery tickets? Yes, they can. Okay, what gives the state the power to ban lottery ticket sales? What do we call that thing? Police power. Bingo, police power, right? Harlan basically says, look, if, if the states can ban lottery tickets, why can't Congress? But you sure said, wait a minute, Josh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't add up, right? Didn't we just say that Congress doesn't have the federal police power? Harlan is very gently nudging that aside. He, he, 
he was very smart. He saw where things were headed. Uh, in fact, Justice Harlan uh, taught uh, constitutional law while he was a justice. Imagine that. You're stuck with me. <laughs> His students had an actual U.S. Supreme Court justice. He would teach at night at George, what's now George Washington Law School. Uh, and actually, one of his students transcribed his lecture notes verbatim, shorthand. And I actually had them typed up in an article some years ago. So I read all of his lectures. I actually still stuff him. He was a very good teacher. Um, but he saw things that people didn't quite see. He knew where this was headed. He recognized that federal power would become much greater. So he's basically saying, look, if the states can do it, why not Congress? And it doesn't really matter that the states can do it, Congress can do it as well. We have to be deferential. But you're already seeing that Harlan is recognizing that something might be too broad here, right? He says, well, this case is only about lottery tickets. There might be other cases that go too far. There might be abuses of power. And he says, if Congress goes too far and abuses its powers, then the courts can step in. We don't need a rule here. We don't need a bright line rule. Uh, all we decide is that tickets are commerce. You can see, though, he's getting a little bit antsy that if you take his opinion seriously, there are virtually no limits on what Congress can do. He's already sort of aware of this. He also says, but you know, this is obviously moral, whatever. But now we have the dissent. And the dissent is by Chief Justice Fuller. Recall, Fuller wrote the majority opinion in E.C. Knight a couple, a couple years earlier, right? So it flips. E.C. Knight was 1895. Right? And then 1903 is Champion versus Ames. And the opinion flips. And Chief Justice Fuller says Congress has no interest to regulate morality. It's for the states. And Fuller says if you actually give Congress a power to ban lottery tickets, you're giving Congress a police power. And that defeats the operation of the Tenth Amendment. Uh, we discussed the Tenth Amendment last week. Do I have it up here? I do not. Of course I don't. Uh, but the 10th Amendment, here, I'll get it. OK. OK, the 10th Amendment provides the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by to the states reserved to the states. As you expand the powers delegated to the federal government, you shrink the powers reserved to the states. Right? They're, they're, they're in an inverse relationship. Right? Now Congress can ban lottery tickets. What if a state wants to sell lottery tickets right, to make money? They can't. Right? By expanding federal power, you contract state power. OK, any questions on Champion versus Ames? Please. Didn't Congress just abolish international trade in, was it the 20th, um, yep. Paraguay, these tickets? They could have. There were also domestic lottery tickets. Okay. Right? There were, they they could have just been. But yeah, uh, there were states that had them. I actually tried finding pictures of these Paraguayan lottery tickets. I was not able to. I found some from much later, but not from this era. I, was, I really wanted a picture of one. Yeah, yeah. No. They the yes. To yes. Teams. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, what if one state wanted to import lottery tickets to raise revenue? They could not do that. Better example. Okay. Anything else in Champion? Yeah. Brandon. Um, was there like a federal police power at this point in general? There was starting to be one, right? The progressives largely view the federal government as an effective means to regulate the health safety, welfare, and the morals of the people. And he puts a lot of weight in the fact these were immoral, he calls a pestilence, right? Like, 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 like a bug in commerce to get rid of. All right, last case. Uh, I think, Deanna, you're next? Yeah. OK, so the last case we have is Hammer versus Dagenhart. And this was like the last major case in which the court said no to federal power. So what were the facts here, Deanna? OK, 
Okay, so this is a federal law that banned the shipment in interstate commerce of goods made with child labor. Now, Deanna, wait a minute. Didn't we just say you can actually regulate the 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 actual shipment of, of stuff? Didn't we say that like a minute ago in, in, in uh, EC Night? Why in this case is a court hold, uh, Vanessa, that um, Congress cannot ban the shipment of goods made with child labor? Um, they said this case is more about workplace conditions, not the Oh. So, Vanessa, is the real reason that this law was enacted to keep commerce free of child labor goods, or is this to regulate local labor conditions? To regulate Yeah. So here's how it happens, right? If you make it a crime to ship goods made with child labor, no one's going to make these goods for one state. They make them to be shipped over state lines. And the court holds that this is basically a way of regulating local labor conditions, right? It's not necessary, right? That this goes too far. That this is really no different than EC Knight. This is not really a ban on shipment, it's a ban on regulation. Even though the statute says shipment, this is actually a law. So here the, the court is trying to determine Congress's actual purpose, not what they say the statute's for. Uh, you know the phrase pretext, right? Where you say of one reason, but really of another. Here the court is scrutinizing the means Congress is using, which is exactly the opposite of what Story said in Prigg, and what the court said in, East, in, in, uh, in, in Knox v. Lee. Right? Uh, so therefore, the court says they cannot go too far. And the court, I think, here is recognizing we have to draw a line. If we allow Congress to ban the shipment of X, then they can also ban X. The court says, if Congress can regulate matters entrusted to local authority, all freedom of commerce will be at an end. And the power of the states over local matters may be eliminated. And thus our system of government be practically destroyed. Wow, that's big language, right? That if you allow Congress to ban the shipment of child labor goods, our system of government be practically destroyed. Note, the court does not say that a state ban on child labor is unconstitutional. They never had that kind of decision. This was the federal ban on child labor. All right, so the court says this goes too far. It's for the states to regulate workplace conditions, not the feds. Questions on the, champ on the uh, hammer majority? Uh, Caitlin, oh. Caitlin, walk me through the dissent by Justice Holmes. Yeah, with Harlan, yeah. The, um, what was it? Uh, but, um, it should be before um, we get some kind of commerce by manufacturing or banning child labor. Yeah, so Kay Caitlin, what's the argument that Congress can use this necessary and proper clause powers to ban child labor? What's, how does the local manufacture of child labor um, have an effect in interstate commerce? How does local child labor affect interstate commerce? Generally, why do firms employ children? What's the general reason why? It's cheaper. And when you have cheaper labor costs, what's it do to the price of goods? I'm sorry? Yeah, down, right? If you use child labor, your labor costs are lower, goods are cheaper. So let's say South Carolina allows child labor and New York doesn't. Which state's exports will be cheaper? South Carolina. New York has more expensive exports. What if Congress says, we don't want states with child labor gaining a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Right? We want all the states to be in the level playing field, so we will ban the shipment of interstate commerce of child labor goods. The dissent says that's fine, right? That's a direct effect, right? The ability to have child labor directly affects prices in other states because you're shipping it to other states. Therefore, even under the rule in Champion or EC Knight, this should be allowed. But here the court's saying that, no, 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 direct effect isn't even enough, right? This is trying to take over the power of our local state governments and would abolish our government. 
But the dissent says we defer. If Congress thinks it's a reasonable way to prohibit these goods from entering the marketplace and uh, distorting the, 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 the nationwide market for furniture, whatever it is, then Congress has the power here. They are shipping their goods, and then the states can be, I'm sorry, the state, the businesses can be regulated. Okay. Questions on Hammer? All right, let me sum up a bit. Um, what we see here, I, I, I do like this graphical representation, is that the court has not had a single approach to the concept of enumerated powers. Uh, it's fluctuated. Um, with respect to implied powers, at times they've been very broad, at times they've been narrow, broad, narrow. But after today's class, it goes up and up and up and up and up. Where in every successive decision, the court either stays the same or goes higher about how much deference Congress has. And as Congress aggrandizes, as they acquire more powers, invariably the powers of the state are reduced. Uh, let's say a state wants to have child labor. If Congress says no, then they can't. Uh, if a state says we want to have a minimum wage of $7 and Congress says no, no, $9, right? That reduces the power of the states to govern themselves in some regards. So the history of our country has been in one of a steep climb uh, uh, towards uh, federal power, okay? Uh, no class on Thursday. I will be uh, traveling. I'll be out of town. We'll be back here on Tuesday, the 3rd, and we'll be talking about enumerated powers in... Just, just wait to pack up. I'm not done. Just, just, just give me 30 more seconds. I always say thank you. Then you can pack up. Uh, we'll do enumerated powers in the New Deal and the Warren Courts. Are there any questions? Okay, I'll see you all a week from today, Tuesday, the 3rd. Thank you.